And so here's two must no determinants of occlusion. Let's just, uh, to illustrate this, let's just remove the back teeth uh, just for purposes of illustration and say, okay, we want the back end completely seated. We want the front end completely seated. And now if we've got that right, we can bring the back teeth into contact between those two and we'll have equilibrium of all parts of the system starting with centric relation in the back, stable anterior stops in the front, non-interfering teeth in the back, and if we get those three red circles filled in just right, then the muscles will be coordinated and functional and peaceful. It's predictable. And, and how do we know that? We know this from just numerous EMG studies. We can show you how muscle hyperactivity results from occlusal interferences. We can take away the occlusal interferences and show you how qu quickly the muscles settle right down to a peaceful neuromusculature. And so this is the end result that we want for everything we do with an occlusion. All right, let's take this understanding and look at occlusal interferences as a multifactorial disorder. Let's take a mouth and just pretend that this mouth uh, is perfect, that the occlusion is perfect, equal intensity contacts all the way around, and so that when you close, every two strikes simultaneously with equal intensity, and that there are no interferences anywhere in the bite. The patient is 100% comfortable. Uh, the teeth are tight. There's no wear problems, uh, and uh, it's just totally comfortable. All right, now we just want to add one thing. We want to add an occlusal interference to that second molar. And you look where the red mark is, and let's just say that that's introduced to a perfected occlusion, either orthodontically or with a crown that isn't exactly right. Now, what are all the things that can happen from just that one interference on one tooth? And if we look at it from the perspective of all the possibilities, what would we say? Well, we say, what's the first thing that you suspect could happen? Well, for one thing, the tooth gets sore. What's another thing could happen? Well, the tooth could get loose. Third thing, the tooth can wear or split. Those are the, the signs of instability that the dentist has to look for. But they're very real, and we see that when we see this type of occlusal interference. But what else can happen? Well, when you close into that interference, the jaw has a tendency, there's a, there's a sensory system around the roots and within the roots of that tooth that's striking first that signals the neuromuscular system to avoid that. Otherwise, if it didn't, then you just close only into centric and you just keep pounding and pounding and pounding that tooth. But instead, it sends the jaw to go around that interference to maximal intercuspation. But in the process, it drives the mandible forward. So then what do we see? Well, we see other teeth get sore because you see that posterior interference, one of the common things we see is that posterior interferences that drive the jaw forward, drive the lower anterior teeth into the upper anterior teeth. And so the front teeth start to bump. So many times we see dentists going in there and grinding the front teeth. The front teeth is not the problem. The problem is in the back tooth interferences that are driving the jaw forward into those upper anterior teeth. And so the next thing that can happen from a posterior interference like this is that other teeth get sore. Other teeth get loose. We'll very often see uh, spaces start to develop between uh, upper anterior teeth as a result of a posterior interference that drives the jaw forward. We correct the posterior interference, let the jaw go back into centric, and that diastema will just close right back down. The other thing that can happen is that uh, the teeth wear. They can wear, get loose, or move, but, and they can also get sore. What's another thing that can happen from this same interference, same interference that is causing this other thing is activating a lot of muscle to avoid it. So muscle gets sore. And muscle can result in temporal tension headaches that it can be really severe. Patients have no idea that, it's a, that a dentist can get rid of these headaches, but it's, it's very predictive. In most instances, we can get rid of those temporal headaches. 
because they're occlusally induced. And uh, if we can determine there's an occlusal cause for that tension headache, well, you'll be amazed at how excited your patient is to be free of headaches. And this is something that we've experienced with great joy over a lot of years because I couldn't even count the number of patients where we've totally eliminated headache problems uh, in patients that had no idea that was a dental problem. And that's where you'll become the go-to dentist when you do this a few times and the patients start getting the word out that, hey, this is a different kind of dentist. Uh, and so you see this. You see the, the added problems of periodontal disease when teeth are loose. Uh, you can see uh, uh, this, uh, this thing progressing to a point where they keep going to the dentist and say, my teeth are sore. I've got the head pain ever since you put that crown in there. And, and the dentist doesn't know what to do about it. He says, well, there's, there's nothing I can do. It's, it's all in your head. You've got to learn to live with this problem. And, and then they get a psychological problem. And they, I've seen many patients through the years that were sent to psychiatrists to solve a problem that the dentist could have taken care of in 15 or 20 minutes, seen it over and over again. And so you see all of these things can result from a single little interference. But there's something else that you have to understand. And that is the next thing that can happen is all of the above. I've seen many patients. They have all these problems. They have loose teeth. They have wear problems. They have muscle soreness. They have psychological problems. They have loose anterior teeth uh, because of occlusal interferences like this. But don't miss the last one. It can also be none of the above. See, we can see patients with an occlusal interference and not see any problems. Now, let me tell you this. If you see too many of these patients with occlusal interferences and no problems, you're not examining carefully because it's a rarity. It's a real rarity. You just don't see this very often. But you will see it periodically. And the only way you're going to know that there are no problems is by looking for signs uh, as well as symptoms. And if you don't see any sign of instability, and your patient is totally comfortable, and you've checked their muscles and checked the teeth for soreness and all this, and they don't have any sign of instability, and they're totally comfortable, and they like their appearance and all, then you don't really have to do anything. Just don't count on seeing too many of these patients. Because as you start understanding the cause-effect nature of occlusal interferences with all these signs and symptoms, you're going to start looking for them, and you're going to see them. And you're going to say, you're, going to, you're, you're, going, you're not going to be able to keep your hands out of their mouth when you see these things because you know you can help them. And that's when you start becoming a really exciting dentist that loves what you do. But if, if you're not doing exams and looking for signs, you're going to miss a lot of these opportunities.